Lord, your love is indeed marvelous and wonderful. And to think that the triune God at the center of all reality, the one who's so glorious we couldn't even possibly imagine it, you, that God, loves us, for us, knows us, is concerned about each of us as more than we can take in. But we are grateful. It gives us so much hope and confidence for every day. We love you so much and are so grateful again to belong to you, to be involved with you, to have you at the center of our lives. We're ready for you to speak. We're looking into your word and we're counting on you by your Holy Spirit to speak because we're, we're eager to hear because we want to live differently. We want to be directed so we can live according to your purposes this week. So Holy Spirit, please fill up this room and, and speak now as we look into your word. We love you and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you can be seated. Uh, good morning again. Really good to have you here at Hillside. And, and good if you're in the room and good to have you if you're watching from home. We're, we're really delighted that you're, uh, you're here in that way uh, at home. Pull out your notes. They're going to help you follow along in this message. And listen to this passage. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Again, it's in your message notes. And this is a big passage. And I'm wondering if uh, it may pop for you in a new way in light of the exploration that we have been in of the hillside mission, which is to be light in the world, or more specifically, to make mature and equipped disciples who share Christ and serve the world. Two different ways of saying the same thing. But listen to this passage and see again if in light of the context, uh, it pops for you in a new way. It begins this way. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Let's stop right there for a minute. Does that phrase, called us to his own glory, does that uh, ring a bell for you? Especially if you were here last spring uh, after Easter. If you were here last spring, you know that we studied the book of Philippians together. And the big idea of that series, which went all the way to summer, uh, a, a series that we called Glory Quest, is that one way to characterize the aim of the Christian life after we believe in Jesus and after we become enveloped in his love and friendship, one way to characterize the aim is to recover glory. And that may surprise you if you're new. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just checking out uh, Christianity. You might be surprised to hear that Christianity has anything to do with seeking our own glory. But here's what's absolutely critical to get. In the Bible, when applied to human beings, glory does not mainly mean our own fame. It doesn't mainly mean uh, our own number of likes. It doesn't mean our follower count. Rather, glory in the Bible, when applied to human beings, means something very particular. It means shining Jesus-like personhood that benefits the world and brings God glory. It's a kind of personhood that makes God look really, really good. And here in verse three, we find that idea, don't we? Look at it. It's not just in Philippians. The Christian life is a glory quest. He's called us to his own glory and excellence. Now let's keep going. Verse four, by which he's granted to us his precious and very great promises, get this, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Wow. Wow. Let's pause there. I mean, what a statement. God's 
purpose in saving us is for us to become, he says, partakers of his own essence or his own character. I mean, that is a down to the beams and studs kind of remodel that he's interested in us. Picking up at verse five, it's a little bit dense, but stick with me. He says, for this very reason, meaning getting a new nature like God's own over time, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for, and don't get, don't miss this, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and notice the word qualities there. I'm hoping some bells are going off in your mind. This is a word that we've used a lot over the last four weeks since we've been in this series in which we're going deep below the hillside mission. And what does Peter say? It's right here. He says that if these Jesus-like qualities, you could say these brilliant colors of Jesus's own character, if they become ours, and if over time they begin to brighten, he says, we will be effective and fruitful in our knowledge of God, which boils down to this. It boils down to being successful in life, successful in the seven or eight or maybe nine decades that we get in this age. Last week, I shared with you the two passages making up the supports for the bridge of our mission. And if you, if you have a mission a document handout. It would have been on your seat when you came in. Why don't you look at it right now and look at the sign that says disciple, the side that says discipleship pathway. And if you look at it, its basic shape kind of looks like a bridge. And one way to understand our purpose as a church is as a bridge. It's a bridge taking people from the land of unconnected to Jesus, not knowing him, not caring about him, maybe not thinking about him at all from that land to the land, a new land, of, of being his personal friend, and you could even say his mini-me in the world, doing the kind of things that he did. Well, this blockbuster passage we just read, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8, it could have been a, thor a third support for that bridge. Uh, and think of its flow. Think of its basic flow. First, it says, we receive from God. We we receive his forgiveness, his friendship. We receive his power. The Christian life always begins humble and it begins open-handed. It often begins wet because it marks its beginning with baptism. And in this first stage, we come to God and we say, I need you. We, we recognize that we have failed in our created calling that, that the, the mission God gave us when he made us to, to image him in the world in all sorts of different ways. And then in the, the forgiveness, the friendship, the, the, the new power, the new identity as a, a, a child of God, that which he lavishes on us at the very moment that we hand our lives over to him, we hand our hearts over to him, we begin to learn a brand new way of living. And this is where the fun begins because to be a Christian is to be a protege of the most shining human being who ever lived. It's to live with him and to learn to be able to do the kind of things that he did. And with our fellow protégés, we begin cultivating a brand new kind of inside, a new set of internal qualities that actually look like Jesus himself. And we do this, we cultivate this new personhood in the interest of being true to, succeeding in the purpose that God had in mind when he made us, which is to be these reflector beams of God's goodness, his justice, his mercy, his creativity everywhere throughout the world. 
everywhere from the office, from where we work, to chemistry class, to the gym, to the Park Mead neighborhood block party, everywhere. And if you're new, again, checking out Christianity, I mean, just chew on that idea for a moment. It is such a remarkable one that the king of this world, the one who's actually in charge of this world, is the, the, the one who is the master of human life, who knows more about living than anyone else, who knows how to live it. This figure who's alive and alive with us right now, he is offering you his personal mentoring. That's the life of faith. In our mixture this morning, we asked if you could learn a skill from any expert, what would the skill be and who would the expert be? We had some great answers in our little mixer group, but I'm wondering for the skill, if anyone just said, being a human being, because <laughs> that's pretty tricky, isn't it? Just look at Ben Affleck, right? <laughs> and look at the rest of us, right? because we don't have it down any better than he does. Jesus is the expert of human living. And this Jesus offers us his mentorship to anybody who wants it. And we would be fools not to take it. I mean, isn't this a great passage? And I hope that in your, your, your ongoing quest to be wise in the word, you're gonna tuck away this passage. Underline it in your, pass, in your Bible and know it. If you're new this morning, let me get you quickly up to speed. We're four weeks into a series of talks called The Deep, a journey to the depth of the Hillside Mission. And in this series, which we're going to be in for, for most of the fall, we're studying the ocean below our 12-word mission statement because there is a lot underneath each key word. And the first of the four key words is mature, which you can see if you look at uh, the mission side of your mission document. Now last week in our dive, we studied the first of the nine Jesus-like qualities underneath mature, these colors of his character that we're invited to cultivate in our relationship with him. And the first one was, was joyful. We learned that, that God wills our joyfulness. God wants us to feel joy. And the reason for that is joy, as we talked about last week, is the, the fuel of living with and for Jesus. We learned that the joy and joyfulness is of just deadly seriousness in the Christian life. And you could say this, when we are in a basic state of joy in the Lord, and I want to tell you, I know this personally, <laughs> When we are in a general state of joy in the Lord, we are essentially bulletproof. And alternatively, when we are experiencing a joy deficit, when we're joyless, we are vulnerable to all kinds of withering fire. And that's why it's good news that, that God invites us to cultivate joy. That was the first quality. And today we reach the second Jesus-like quality, and I'm going to cut right to the chase and tell you what it is. It's loving. Second mature Jesus-like quality that we're seeking to cultivate together is loving to our core. You know, if you look at Jesus' life, you see that Jesus, he loved the people that he interacted with. And Jesus loved people because he was loving to the core Jesus' essence was love, and the reason that was the case is he was the embodiment of the God who is love to the core. God is love, 1 John says, twice. In a Mark's biography of Jesus, the book he writes telling the story of Jesus' life, at one point this guy runs up to Jesus right before Jesus is about to head out on another uh, preaching and healing tour, and he, he gets down below Jesus, and, and, and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, you, you know the commandments, to which the man replies, all these I've kept from my youth. To which Jesus replies, you lack one thing, go 
and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And here's the key part. And come, follow me. In other words, he's saying, come and be my apprentice. Come and be my protege. Wrap your whole life around savoring my friendship and learning my lifestyle. Same invitation he offers to every human being today. Whoever that person is, whatever they've experienced, however they understand themselves. He offers the same invitation today. Black, white, rich, poor, right, left, niner, radar, uh, raider, straight, non-conforming. He offers it to everyone. And whoever you are, he will take you into his life and heart and he will transform you bit by bit from the inside out, remaking you down to the level of your identity, down to the level of your desires, and he will remake you in his own truly human template. That's what's baked into the offer that Jesus makes to this guy and the same offer he makes to us today. Unfortunately, the guy declines. He doesn't want to follow Jesus. It would require too much life reorganization. He understands that it would be about following a real person and learning how to live his way. But here's what's to notice for our purposes this morning. Just before reporting Jesus' offer to the man, Mark writes this. Listen. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And that verse has always moved me. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. And it's amazing how important looking is for conveying love. The other day, I met a friend from Hillside uh, down at Starbucks, the one just down the hill, Mount Diablo and Locust. And the teenager working the register did something that absolutely shocked me. And I just about reported her to her manager. It was so bewildering and unexpected. I should have made a TikTok about it, but I was too busy. <laughs> you know what it was? She looked at me in the eye and she smiled. It's true. I was just about to meet Roy Wensley. And then she said, what do you have going on today? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was such a surprise and such a delight to have that warm look. And we see here that Jesus communicated love to the people that he interacted with, partly with how he looked at people. And we can do the same, you know, as friends, as co-classmates here in this King Jesus Academy, which is Hillside Covenant. At least case, we can look at each other deeply in the eye, seeing each other as a fellow beloved son or daughter of the King, and we can smile, if nothing more. But the larger point, Jesus was constitutionally loving. And the reason he was is that he embodied the God of love. Now, if we want to understand the, the kind of love that was behind that look and the kind of love that we are called to give to other people, all we really need to do is just look at the life of Jesus and we'll see it there. But we can also grasp, come to a deeper understanding of this second quality, the second color in Jesus's personhood by looking at a handful of on-point verses. And let me read them to you, just three. There are many more we could have chosen. And then I think that you will see a picture emerging, almost like a Polaroid, all right? Romans 5, 8, listen to this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So the question, what do these verses tell us about what love means in the Bible? I think it's pretty transparent. It's this, it's love is self-extending, need-meeting service. That's its essence. And we can know that if we think about it. You know, our supreme need as human beings was forgiveness. It was cleansing. It was a fresh start in our created purpose, which could only happen through Jesus' death on the cross for us. Well, because of his love, that's precisely what God provided for us. Precisely what we needed at excruciating personal cost. And as is regularly stated, this is something that we know, but something that we need to say over and over again because it's so counterintuitive uh, to the way we think. In the biblical sense, love is not a feeling, it, it, romantic or otherwise. As C.S. Lewis wrote, famous book, The Four Loves, it's a wonderful thing when tender feelings become connected with our acts of love for other people. But that's not its essence. The essence of the love that God calls us to bestow on others and the essence of the love that God calls us to become, agape, it's pinpoint, practical service that meets the need of that person. Which is why John says, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. I have so many people who love me this way. <laughs> I really do. People who actually love me with words, which mean an immense amount to me, but also love me by helping me <laughs> in the ways that I need help. You can see one right there. How do we, we cultivate this? How do we actually do it, this Jesus quality as his apprentices? And here's the, the, the uh, to put a finer point on the question. How do we become agape? Because again, that's the vision of Christian spirituality in, in contrast to a lot of other faith systems that are out there. It's not just doing something, it's becoming something. A new kind of thing. It's developing a character like Jesus' own. Becoming a partaker of his nature like we talked about. And I think that there are two main ways that scripture gives us. The first one jumps right off the page. The second one takes a few more steps. Let's start with the first one, okay? Colossians 3, 12 through 13, Paul calls on people like us, people who have begun to journey with Jesus as his apprentices and his learners. He tells us to put on a set of Jesus-like qualities. And in this sense, this passage, Colossians 3, is very much like the one we started with. It, it, it's very similar to 2 Peter chapter 1. It's a call for people who have already been bathed in God's grace in Jesus, who are in the family, on the team, named his special child, marked out for eternal life, every imaginable spiritual blessing. It's a call for people like that, people like us, to cultivate a new kind of personhood. We started talking about that personhood in the series. We got more to go. But then, in verse 14, Coach Paul says this. Listen. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Well, what does it mean to put on love? What does that mean? Very simply, it means this. It means to practice it. To put on love is to practice love. It's to act loving, regardless of how we might feel in that moment, by giving pinpoint practical service even when we don't feel like it. And this is really interesting. I think this will shine a light on what Paul is talking about here. The Greek verb translated put on is enduo. And it literally means to put on clothes. It means to dress. And think about this. Think about how much what we feel depends upon what we wear. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I'll give you an illustration this way. As I've mentioned before, as a young adult, I spent 11 of the happiest summers of my life working at a Christian camp called Camp Hammer. And uh, in fact, one of my most valued partners 
for, for, for many summers at Camp Hammer is here, Jeannie. I'm so happy to see you, Jeannie. Sign very significant experience for both of us. Um, and for a bunch of those summers uh, serving on the program staff, one of my responsibilities was acting in skits that would introduce night games, entertain the kids over milkshakes and that sort of thing. And these skits were just a signature part of Camp Hammer, significant part of kind of what made Camp Hammer really special. And we did these manic skits nightly, and it was really fun, certainly. It was just a, a thrill. It could also be very tiring <laughs> to, to try to be entertaining <laughs> uh, on command. Um, but I remember Mark Spurlock, who was our director at the time, and still the finest Christian leader I have ever worked for. He's a pastor in Santa Cruz. I remember him coaching us and saying this. I've never forgotten it. Get the costume right. Get the costume right. Because if you look funny, you will feel funny. And you will be funny. And he was right. And I learned that, you know, even if I wasn't in the mood for the skit, as soon as I put on the costume, as soon as I put on the silly costume, the several sizes too small court jester tunic, or uh, the plaid Bob, Bar Bob Barker suit for hosting our own Camp Hammer version of The Price is Right, complete with baby powder frosted hair to look like Bob. As soon as I put on that costume, I would feel different. <laughs> and I would be ready to do my thing. And I think you can see the point. You know, when we simply put on or practice love in the way that Paul tells us to in Colossians 3, we begin to feel loving. We feel differently. Which in turn leads to more practice. Which in turn, thanks to the Spirit, learns, leads to heart change at the deepest level. So what's this boil down to? As, as, as disciples seeking to cultivate a heart of love like Jesus, we practice and we remember who we are. We remember our new identity having come out of the baptistry. We're filled with God's spirit. We have a new essence, a new nature inside us already. And we can begin to practice by loving them in the way Jesus did. That's the first path. It's practice, which you can do. I can do because we have a spirit-empowered nature. But here's the other one. It's a little less immediate. There's no one obvious proof text, but I think it's more fundamental. In fact, I think it's even necessary for practice. If you want to practice, you need to take this path first. And to arrive at it, we got to first notice a very interesting biblical fact. Over and over again, and you, and you see it everywhere in the New Testament, the writers refer to the disciples that they are writing to as beloved. And an example is Paul in Romans 16, 12. Greet the beloved Persis. And you see this everywhere. Now, for reading the Bible in some versions, uh, we'll miss this because they uh, translate the Greek word behind beloved as dear friend, trying to make it a little easier for people to understand. But that's actually not that helpful because the Greek word in each case is love. It's agape. Or more specific, the, the adjective form of it, agapetos, okay? Now, why do these biblical writers, and, and it's, it's all of them, essentially. It's Paul, it's the writer of Hebrews, it's James, it's Peter, it's Jude. Why do they do that? Why do they refer to these people as beloved? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is they mean to express their very real love for the people that they're, they're coaching in the Lord. But even more importantly, they refer to them as beloved because that's how God sees the people that they're writing to. And that's crystal clear from numerous passages. Listen to this, Romans 1, 7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God. It's Greek word agape. Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And then Colossians 3, 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. And so the question is, what's significant about that fact? That God calls us his 
beloved, especially for the question that we're dealing with right now on the workbench, how we can become more agape, more loving to our core. And it becomes clear when we consider this fact. And it's stunning what God calls his own son. <laughs> beloved. It's what he calls us. And when God calls his own precious eternal son beloved, there's nothing clinical, nothing obligatory, nothing perfunctory, nothing technical, nothing clinical about it. God's agape for his own son is full of feeling. It's full of pleasure. It's full of delight. I mean, is your love for your children clinical, perfunctory, Technical? No, when you look at them, your heart melts. It almost hurts. Do you know what I'm talking about? You look at your kids and it almost hurts. You love them so much. That's how he loves you. That's how he loves me. And maybe you're thinking, oh, that's just preacher talk. No, we can pin it down. Look at his baptism. In each account, God the Father refers to his son as his beloved. Again, the same term he uses to describe how he feels about us. And then he goes on as if that weren't enough. In each account, God adds that his beloved son is one in whom he is well pleased, which means this is the one who brings me distinct joy. This is one who brings me distinct satisfaction, pleasure, delight. What's the upshot? Again, what the eternal God feels about his own son. He feels about his children by faith. He feels about us the same way. And that agape, that fierce commitment love mixed with feeling so strong it almost hurts is what he experiences when he looks at you and when he looks at me. And you see, when we begin to abide in that agape, which the Bible tells us to do, and when we become more and more rooted and established in that agape, which is what the Bible says we are to do, and when more and more we come to know and rely on that agape, which is language right from Scripture, we begin to change. We begin to become more agape, and as a result, that agape for others over time becomes more natural more organic, more authentic, because agape is not just what we do anymore, it's what we've become. That's the vision. Let me close with this. I'm gonna spill the beans and say that one of the six Jesus-like abilities, which is gonna come up in the series, is this, it's making and deepening relationships in the family, church, and community. It's going to be the topic of the sermon on November 10th. So it's coming up. But one of the main obstacles, I think, to people becoming equipped in that way, becoming better equipped in making and deepening relationships is, I don't know what we could call it, social dread. And the voice in the head that says, you know, I'm, I'm not that valuable. I'm not wanted Nobody would notice if I were gone. I'm not as cool or appealing as X person. And that social dread, which if you're a teenager is just totally exacerbated by social media, right? That social dread strangles engagement with others. As soon as that idea starts swirling around in our head, we're not wanted, we're not valuable, nobody appreciates us, we're a liability, engagement with others is strangled. But here's the thing, what we've learned this morning about growing an agape heart could be a game, a game changer, if that's you. If, if, if you feel that deep social dread when you engage in a new situation. But think about this, what if, what if every time we walked into church or every time we went to our home group or every time we walked into the well that's beginning soon. What if we disciples imagined what is supremely true? And what if we imagined 
God introducing each of us the way God introduced his son at his baptism. And what if we imagine him saying this, this everybody is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Or alternatively, this everybody is my beloved son who brings me intense joy, who I really dig. And think about the impact in our sharing in our serving, if this were our mindset walking into every single party, I am God's beloved. I'm a child who brings him delight and satisfaction. Now, who here needs God's love through me? Father, we marvel at the depth of your love for us. And in this moment, we bathe in your agape so that more than ever, we can become it ourselves. And we pray in Christ. Amen.